In 2001, video games had a reputation for not being especially sophisticated in their storytelling. The straightforwardness of the plots, usually involving some evil corporation or another, were a throwback to a simpler time of one-liner-driven dialogue and spectacle-driven plotting. The first Max Payne, by Remedy Games, uses the ancient, predictable, hard-boiled detective archetype to provide a kind of resonance with the player's actual mechanical journey through the world. You are living a fatalistic story. All the levels are already programmed, all the twists laid out, all waiting for pain to go through the living of it step by step. So the game begins with a flash forward to the very end. This isn't a game about choice. It isn't a game about freedom. It's a game about an angry, wronged man and all the bullets that stand in the way of the vengeance he craves from Act 1, Scene 1. The hard-boiled detective has been a cliché since not long after they were introduced in the 1930s. Fast-talking, hard-drinking men who view the world through a thick lens of cynicism and dark irony. They live in a world where whiskey is measured in fingers, lives are measured in seconds, and women are almost always some kind of trouble that you ain't looking for. Noir movies added an element of artistic depth to the presentation, but for decades, the many knockoffs of the Sam Spade archetype slumped deeper and deeper into predictability and irrelevance during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The Coen Brothers' Big Lebowski movie illustrates the difficulty of updating the old archetype to work in the modern age. In many ways, the dude story is structured like a traditional hard-boiled mystery, but the dude himself is a decidedly soft-boiled detective, utterly unprepared, tugging random strings on an incomprehensible knot of human chaos. Take the scene at Jackie Treehorn's party. The dude sees him take a note during a suspicious phone call, and then uses a pencil to retrace the note like any good Pinkerton, but it's not a clue. It's a goofy doodle of a guy with a three-foot erection. The hard-boiled detective with a just-the-facts-ma'am attitude and a gritty metaphor for every trivial interaction, is ultimately more outmatched by the kaleidoscope of human failure and greed in the cell phone era than they would be outgunned by some two-bit Jersey mobsters. That's where Max Payne comes into the equation. If you put a character with the straightforwardness of the old hard-boiled detectives in the modern era, where basic truths are rarely agreed on and often obscured, they seem hopelessly anachronistic and slightly useless. Taking the world more seriously, you end up with something like The Big Lebowski, something that constantly paints its protagonist like a fool. Taking the main character more seriously than the world, you come down on the side of Max Payne, where it's the world that's outrageous and foolish, and it's down to Max to smash the world's falsehoods to pieces and put the pieces back together into something that makes sense. Everything about Max Payne's game world is a wild exaggeration, in gesture, in speech, in plot, and in play. Against this backdrop of absurd excess, Max Payne feels more like a real person than he ought to. That counterintuitive humanity carries Max through three games, from his wife's death and his quest for revenge in the first game, through Max's sad, messy midlife breakdown in the third. No matter how ridiculous the world, the dialogue, or the action gets, Max is always a steady constant. It might take him four or five metaphors and three additional gritty one-liners to get there, but Max Payne always shows himself to be a well-intentioned man in a foul, cruel world. This gets him shot at constantly. It's the shooting in Max Payne that's more famous than the man himself, anyway. Max Payne was one of the earliest games to use bullet time mechanics, all of the Matrix movies, where everything slows to a crawl to show the impossible acrobatics of combat and the dramatic trajectories of bullets on their way to a target. My first encounter with bullet-time-driven action in a game was first-person shooter Fear, which came out in 2005. Back in 2001, Max Payne's third-person leaping and dodging does give a slightly different flavor to it, but I was surprised how the rhythm of combat in each game revolves around the bullet-time mechanic as not only an indispensable tool, but maybe more as an anchor for how difficulty and pacing in the combat encounters plays out experientially. It's effectively a superpower, an incredibly unfair advantage for the player to have. Its only balance is in making combat dangerously lethal in a way that even a game like Half-Life isn't. On higher difficulties, Max is convincingly mortal. Bullets aren't good for him, and most are fatal. Even on easy, a shotgun blast or a few Uzi rounds in a row are enough to do Max in. Although progression is quicker on an easier difficulty, you are losing out on some of the core tension of the game, which is equally thematic as it is mechanical. That core tension is that the hired goons he's up against actually do have Max powerfully outmatched and outgunned. The harder the difficulty, the more tangible the feeling of being the underdog in the situation. By actually putting the player in a constant position of being weaker than the enemies, constantly and truly outgunned by them, bullet time becomes less of an obvious superpower. Without it, you're a bullet away from death. With it, same deal, but you see the bullets coming and you can dive away, inches from being snuffed out, one close call after another. 
This is another area where the repetitive clichés of hard-boiled fiction work in the game's favor. It's that moment where the detective crouches behind the bar, frantically reloading his revolver as bottles shatter above him. The moment where the hero rolls away from the explosion, only to come up shooting and reverse the ambush. Those moments, and a hundred more, boil down into set pieces and repeatable animations like popcorn of the imagination. It's a reduction of what's in these old hard-boiled stories, broken down into the smallest divisible elements of excitement and action, and then arranged across relatively bare linear levels. The momentum created by the combat's lethality, though, is tremendous. A single gunfight is over in seconds. For better, Max dodges a spray of shotgun pellets and hits the ground firing, clearing out some goons and immediately getting up to face the next ones. For worse, and you're reloading the combat again and again to figure out a choreography that works. Max Payne's level and encounter design work in tandem to create little linear gun puzzles more often than an emergent AI-driven combat, a kind of rhythm that indie shooter Superhot made its sole naked focus. Here in 2001, though, it's a more awkward and a more deliberately hidden thing. A sensation humming underneath the grid of the city and the fireworks of the combat. That awkwardness of Max's movement, coupled with the unforgiving lethality of gunplay, can lead to some unfair moments where Max is simply too clumsy to live, and it's not much the player's fault. In a modern game, that might be a negative, because almost all of Max Payne's essential mechanics are well-worn clichés of their own nowadays, usually so smoothly implemented as to be hardly noticeable. But as the grandfather of shoot-dodging, bullet-time action, that awkwardness becomes part of the charm back here in the original game, as goofy and likable as Max Payne's scrunched, frustrated face. The face belongs to Sam Lake, one of the founders of Remedy Entertainment and the main writer for Max Payne 1 and 2. This is the other major source of Max Payne 1's charm, the do-it-yourself amateur spirit. The protagonist's face is a series of shifting photograph close-ups of the creator's face wrapped around a 3D model. Lake's words are Max's words. It's rare to have a developer write, direct, and star in their own production, but not only did Lake pull it off, he did it with such style that he achieved a kind of Bruce Campbell-esque B-movie fame out of it. Other members of Remedy's staff, their friends, their family, lend their faces and photos to the game to populate its world. The result is a dark, gritty world of drugs, sex, murder, and lies, whose cast list got mixed up with the IT crowd, but damned if they won't do the job now that they're here. Max Payne has the nerdiest fucking mobsters to ever appear in anything, and I love it. Max Payne was a true blockbuster video game. It had sharper action and more cinematic storytelling than a lot of what was on the market at the time. In the world of video games, this is a very serious mob story of vengeance. And when you read user reviews on Steam, a lot of player nostalgia is driven by having played this game young and taken it entirely seriously. To some, Max Payne 1 is truly a deeply felt story of conspiracy and vengeance. If this had been a movie instead, none of it would fly. It'd be a movie you turned in for a final project to be graded, not one you'd see in a theater near you. The friends and family casting, the earnest, overwrought excess of Max's narration, the smarmy, broadly comic way Max teases the mobsters who want to kill him, the mobsters themselves, a vast army of goons who are most certainly walking here. In movies, it would come off as either satirical or amateurish, probably both. When a Max Payne movie finally did come out, it was incomprehensible, unsatisfying to fans of hard-boiled detective stories, unsatisfying to fans of the video game, or people rooting for Mark Wahlberg's career to succeed. There's nothing about Max Payne the video game that works cinematically, even if the game steals a ton of creative flourishes and visual language from movies. Yet it's charming as hell as a video game, and it's worth looking closely at why that might be. 2001 is still part of the era where games were trying to gain legitimacy as an art form and as an entertainment medium. To be compared to movies was seen as a good thing and not a derisive accusation in a lot of game reviews. Max Payne has a huge ambition towards the cinematic feel, but because of the technological limitations of 2001, the hardware limits of the PlayStation 2 era, it can never really hit that goal. It can only approximate it, a puppet theater version of Grit and Sleaze. Yes, Max is beset by underworld hard cases, but they're all boys in their father's two large suits. Yes, Max navigates a red light warren of seedy hotel brothels, but the best the game can do is throw in some vibrating beds and, some, and the same grainy shot of some anonymous woman's ass plastered on every other wall to remind you that this is the sex place and not the warehouse and not the docks. Max's internal narration never really questions this, although he eventually acknowledges some of the fundamental absurdity. He says, it's only a cliché up until the moment you start living it. And you know, the man's entirely right. His situation is serious, lethal, 
The mechanical way the world engages with you proves this with every turn of the corridor. Max Payne has no choice but to take himself seriously. His wife is dead, and he's a wanted man. This is the image he sees. We see the same things, but perceive them to be made out of construction paper and glitter, the word bang spilling from the barrel of Max's pistol. The contrast is beautifully, counterintuitively, complementary. During a drug-induced dream sequence, Max realizes that he's in a video game. Quote, the truth was burning green crack through my brain. Weapon statistics hanging in the air just out of the corner of my eye. Endless repetition of the act of shooting. Time slowing down to show off my moves. The paranoid feel of someone controlling my every step. I was in a computer game. Funny as hell, it was the most horrible thing I could think of. End quote. Max hits the nail on the head. It's all absurd. All ridiculous. All truly, truly horrible for the poor sack of shit who wound up protagonist in this mean little vengeance narrative. He's barely a cartoon of a real person, a photo of a face wrapped around an imaginary frame, programmed to fight goon after goon until the story ends. And that sounds like a sad-ass life. Max is sympathetic because of his unrealistic excess, not in spite of it. So is the army of goons, for that matter. There's an art to making a common enemy engaging and fun to fight on a consistent basis, and a lot of it has to do with player feedback. In 1997, Half-Life soldiers seemed especially fearsome and clever because, in another instance of counterintuitive design, they announced their intentions to the player directly via radio chatter. The idea is that you're overhearing the chatter, but it's all for the player's benefit. It gives the impression of thought and strategy when what you're experiencing is more algorithm and line of sight. Instead of trying to make the thugs sound fearsome, Max Payne uses a similar kind of chatter to make them sound smug and stupid. The mechanical, strategic reality is that we got him outnumbered, boss, he's just one man, how hard could this be, etc, etc, and without the bullet time mechanic, you probably would just be utterly screwed. So you hear them, on the other side of the door, talking shit about you in a preposterously bad Jersey accent, and you know that their shotguns can cash any checks their mouths write. You also know they won't have time to use them as you dive through the door, hit the ground, and kill everyone in the room before they barely have time to yell, IT'S PAIN! Every time you hear them planning something, you're seconds away from ruining it. Every time you, uh, they have you cornered and start shouting their victory speeches, one of Max's bullets shuts them up. Their AI is poor and awkward compared to something like Half-Life, but Max himself is a little awkward, so the match is still even. The bullet time also shows off Max's kills in bombastic, player-flattering ways. The effect is supposed to mimic legendary director John Woo, but the action choreography is entirely in the player's hands. A well-played encounter ends up being surprisingly cinematic in its abrupt twists, turns, dives, and near misses. A fumbled encounter is a comic outtake before trying again, Max tripping all over himself and falling right on top of an exploding grenade. The goons are like Pringles. Once you pop, you just can't stop. They're all assholes, they're all dangerous, and they scatter and fall before you in unpredictably spectacular displays of violence and power. Their role is to die and to be dislikable, and holy shit are they talented at it. This is amplified by the geeky youth of the Remedy staffers who lent their faces to the game. It adds an element of almost playful make-believe to these unusually regular, everyday-looking bad guys who scrunch up their faces and fall as if they were going to actually yell, Oh, hey, yo, whoa, you got me, copper! before laying politely on the ground until the next round. Another thing that's noticeable as someone who'd play Fear before playing Max Payne is how tightly connected slow-motion combat action is with the destructible elements in the environment and how this creates a unique tone of combat. In Max Payne, electrical things spark and explode, paper and cardboard shred in ragged puffs of debris, bottle shatter, wood splinters. Every bullet causes some kind of damage, even further underlining what a lucky thing it is when none of those bullets hit you. But more than that, the spectacle they add, especially in slow motion, gives a sense of breathless chaos to the firefight that ends up being the glue that holds the gritty parts of the game and the goofy parts of the game together. Max Payne is silly, over-the-top, absurd, and simultaneously earnest in its treatment of Max and the violent cruelties of his world. To experience that contradictory tension as an arc, as a movie, as a story, it's too much and it feels as unbalanced as a washer-dryer with a brick inside. To experience it in a moment, in a single gunfight full of danger and debris, and in those moments the elements find harmony. 
the combat vignettes of the core gameplay loop reorient the player towards having fun in a self-aware way, establishing distance from the overwrought darkness of Max's narration, while also emphasizing the dead seriousness of what all this gunfire means to Max. It's Sam Lake's face, Max Payne's story, but the tension and the thrill of it is all given entirely to the player. Max Payne 1 is a product of its time more than its sequels, not just for the shoestring budget and the small production team behind it, but because of some of the more peculiar twists and turns in the narrative. Modern games often are slightly embarrassed of their cartoonish roots. Lara Croft now has depth and agency, almost in spite of herself. Kratos has to consider what legacy he leaves his son, and even Max Payne himself goes to war with his own addictive despondency in Rockstar Games' franchise finale. Max Payne 1, though, differentiates itself from the kind of action movies it wants to emulate, the gritty, hard-boiled streets of noir York, by drinking deeply from the well of wild and crazy video game storytelling cliches circa 2001. There's a conspiracy to flood the streets with drugs in glowing green vials called Valkyr, which is just the tip of the iceberg for a constant treadmill of references to Norse mythology. The evil green goop was, shocker, originally a government program that took place right here, underneath the city, and the only one willing to help Max is a member of something like the Illuminati, and the evil green group was at the root of the plot to kill Max's family, so his revenge is to kill the CEO of an evil corporation that profits from the goop. There's even a mob boss who has a psychotic break and decorates his nightclub, Ragnarok, with blood and occult symbols. What is this 90s cheese doing in a story that, by its own admission, is trying to be as cinematically gritty as possible for the budget and for the era? It's hard to say, but its presence helps cement Max Payne as being something that only makes sense in the medium of video games. Evil corporations and green goop are old hat for games. Remedy could have brought in Commander Keen, and he probably solved the case as well as Max if that was all there is to it. But it's not. The green goop is fully secondary to all the sincerely written angst and the parade of strained, sour analogies and metaphor that make up Max's inner life. Max Payne is a half-step from the old Duke Nukem days, on their way to the days where even B.J. Blazkowicz feels worry and doubt. It's these weird fantasy elements that derail the Max Payne movies so badly. A Hollywood adaptation can't even figure out how the hell to make them work, because on an aesthetic and thematic level, they really just don't. The only work as part of a lineage of game design cliches that would have felt familiar to players at the time. In 2001, it wasn't such a dumb question to ask if gamers would find a pure cop story too boring. The market was used, was used to excess, so excess it would have. It's a lot like how Max's arsenal stretches all the way back to 1996's Tomb Raider. The dual pistols, the shotgun, the Uzis. If you've played any of those games, you instantly understand the specific mechanical purpose of that weapon. Lara had auto lock-on, though, and Max does it himself. Well, you do, you do it for him. Either way, though, it's borrowing old, familiar phrases from the language of video game design. I'm not knocking it for doing this, mind. It's fascinating to me how certain specific things become shorthand for whole systems of engagement. Max's weapon escalation perfectly mirrors Tomb Raider 2, but it's fine because the emphasis of the broader game is reversed, from 80% platforming and 20% combat to 80% combat and 20% platforming. They're different games with different intentions and wildly different executions, except for the shared elements of useful cliché. When exactly did the Uzi go out of fashion in action games? It's hard to put a finger on, but for a while there, any time you saw one, you instantly knew its characteristics and its strategic purpose in the game. Max Payne 1's evil corporations and myth mythological drugs serve a, s a similar purpose, a shorthand for a certain kind of black-and-white conflict, a simplicity of storytelling that Max can appear like a nuanced character standing next to. Max Payne 1 is a game on the brink of a new era, feet still firmly planted in the old. It's the elements that date the game that end up holding the most appeal for me going back. I love it for its awkwardness, its amateurness, and the tremendous enthusiasm that carries both along. I don't love it for being clever and sharp in its writing and plotting, it really isn't much of either, but I do love it because the language of design it speaks is an old, odd one that I haven't really heard for a long time, and I find myself absolutely borne away by the nostalgia of it. It's one of those rare games whose production circumstances and cultural timing make it impossible to imitate. That's a difficulty that its sequels tried to tackle in two very different ways.
On a surface level, Max Payne 2 is an industry-standard, more-of-the-same sequel, making some improvements and tweaks while also introducing some stuff that pushes the first game's formula so far that it does falter. On a deeper level, Max Payne 2 is one of Remedy's weirdest titles, more meaningfully connected to the Alan Wake games yet to come than the Max Payne game already in the studio's taillights. In one reading, on the surface, it's a story of Max's obsessive streak in love and war, a story where the hard-boiled detective gets too mixed up with the dame he should have known to stay away from. In another reading, it's a deconstruction of the fatalistic predestination that almost all video game protagonists are doomed to fall into, a deconstruction of the very game design clichés that powered the first game, like a kind of Knights of the Old Republic tube for third-person linear action games. The thing is, it's hard to tell which direction Max Payne 2 is leaning at any given moment. Are we meant to be taking Max seriously, or are we meant to be considering him abstractly as a prisoner of the game's mechanical construction? Both? Either? What I'm saying is, fundamentally, Max Payne 2 is a kaleidoscope. One angle, you see a boring by the number sequel missing all the hooks of the original. Another angle, you see a game that's bold enough to make meta-commentary the primary narrative thread. A third angle, it's a discordant mess of both. I'm not able to unite these into some cohesive, unified theory of Max Payne 2. I think any given person's experience in the game is going to be wildly subjective in terms of which game, or which interpretation of the game, resonates strongest. I ask myself, can I boil it down to the question, should you play Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne, when my answer is a resonant, I don't know, maybe? And I guess I just can't resolve that. It's a weird one, stem to stern. To introduce the game properly, I think you have to start with a TV show that plays in the background of a dark, dingy room in Max Payne 1, called Address Unknown. It begins with the lines, The flamingo speaks, it can speak here, and then only gets weirder and darker. The flamingo, the evil, wise flamingo, says, Mirrors are more fun than television, backwards, and then also the flesh of fallen angels, a green, a green goop-related phrase that follows Max around from place to place and character to character. In Max Payne 1, Address Unknown was a throwaway bit, something to unnerve the player and unnerve Max. In Max Payne 2, Address Unknown is the central anchor of the game world. You visit a funhouse themed after the show three times over the course of the game. Max's love interest literally lives there, and the game features six new episodes of Address Unknown sprinkled throughout the levels. It goes deeper. Now that Remedy has a serious budget to work with after the first game's success, they scrapped the photo-wrapped faces for fully 3D ones based on actual actors. Timothy Gibbs lends his face to Max this time around. Yet in Address Unknown, Sam Lake is still the protagonist, a man hunting his double through Noir York City, a thing Max had come up with with a bit of narration in the original game. As Max Payne 2 goes on, Max hallucinates bits and pieces of Address Unknown, waking up to it in the first, in the first of the game's three dream sequences, and then revisiting images from the funhouse, with Max explicitly replacing John Mira, the Address Unknown character. This isn't just a fun series of coincidences, a massive amount of development effort went into setting up these parallels. Address Unknown is the narrative that matters in Max Payne 2. And that makes for a goddamn peculiar experience. Max Payne 2 begins with a flash forward like the original game, and just about the first thing that Max asks is, did I love her? Did I have a choice? Like the original game, everything that happens is a funnel, narrowing to the point where Max reaches this climactic moment, where Mona Sachs dies and he finds himself all alone and covered in blood again. It's a fatalistic certainty that the story will get here. Max at one point says, quote, There are no choices. Nothing but a straight line. The illusion comes afterwards, when he asks, Why me? And what if? When you look back and see the branches, like a pruned bonsai tree or forked lightning. If you had done something differently, it wouldn't be you. It would be someone else looking back, asking a different set of questions. Max Payne is not a role-playing game. Neither you nor he have input on who he is or what he chooses. It was always going to be these exact choices, the choices that Sam Lake wrote for him. Alan Wake, Remedy's next big hit, centers a lot of itself around these questions of free will and creative work, to the extent that the climax of Alan Wake is literally the main character attempting to write himself out of the consequences of his own story. All that's left in a linear game like that is to walk the path besides the main character. Which is exactly what the funhouse level in Max Payne 2 is meant to draw attention to and satirize. The level is actually called, no joke, a linear sequence of scares. There's no enemies the first time you go through, just cardboard cutouts and menacing tableaus. Max says, quote, A funhouse is a linear sequence of scares. Take it or leave it is the only choice given. 
makes you think about free will. Have our choices been made for us because of who we are? At the end of Alan Wake, Alan realizes he cannot write himself a happy ending because he's in a horror story and it would break genre conventions and the magic. Max Payne is equally trapped by the cliches of his genre. The hard-boiled detective is always a tragic figure. They never get a happily ever after. For the player, the game is absolutely a funhouse, a linear sequence of scares, and the only choice given is play or don't play. You know what's in store for poor Max Payne. Nothing you do will change or alter it. It's the destiny of his archetype, and he is every inch the archetype. This kind of satirical meta-commentary is supported by the more regular surface-level plotting, and is in some ways the only way to, squ to square it all together. Back up on the surface level, the game feels like a surprisingly uninspired sequel, reusing pretty much all of the characters left alive at the end of the first game, and very few others, even reusing locations like the Ragnarok Club where you revisit twice more during Max Payne 2. The budget for this game was so much more than the original, and yet its diversity of locations is much smaller, its cast and its conflicts largely recycled from the first game. Let's assume that this was not a cost-saving measure. Let's assume that this is creatively deliberate in some way. Max says, quote, You can't run from your past. You'll end up running in circles until you fall back down to the same hole you're trying to escape from, only the hole's grown deeper. He says, Your past has a way of stinking up on you. You'll hear broken echoes of it everywhere, like a bad replay. You'll get mad at everyone for reminding you about it, even if it's all in your head. End quote. It all comes together to paint a bleak portrait of a man doomed from the start. The state of the world at the end of Max Payne 1 wasn't a triumph, it was just the shape of the trouble to come. Vlad would always betray Max at some point. Alfred Woden was always a bad guy. And Mona and Max would always have a flirtatious attraction to each other. Put all those pieces on the board at the same time, and it's checkmate every time. To take the game at face value, though, you're looking at a game eager to repeat locations, repeat enemies, and repeat motifs with only a paper-thin romantic subplot to tie that all together. Mona Sachs is the game's fracture point. She's either a straightforward femme fatale type with no personality and no meaningful reason to risk it all for Max, or else she's a satirical mirror image of Max, as doomed to be the tough woman who dies tragically, as Max is doomed to be the tough man who has to stoically live with the guilt. There's a bit of graffiti in a dream sequence where Mona Sachs's name is written in blood and Max is capitalized inside it. There are long segments where you play as Mona and nothing about the mechanical experience changes. Mona and Max use bullet time the same. They carry the same kind of weapons and dodge in the same sort of way. There isn't any functional difference between them. There isn't even much difference in personality. They're both wry, sarcastic, and deadly. When Max meets Mona back in the first game, she says it's her sister Lisa, get it, who's the damsel in distress, not her. But when she dies here in the second game, Mona realizes with a bitter laugh that she ended up being a damsel in distress anyway. It's not like this is an accident. Remedy is deliberately drawing attention to the trope, to the cliché of her being one more woman who dies so that Max can have some sort of personal epiphany. Why does she die and Max live, especially if they're basically interchangeable characters? Just because, and explicitly because, it's the genre convention, it's what's expected of such a story. Mona doesn't have agency, not because the writers didn't think she deserved any, but because the whole point of Max Payne 2 is that no one in this game has agency full stop. The inevitabilities of their cliches are like shackles around their ankles. If, on some new cold New York night in 1998, it was Mona's husband screaming an alarm, if it was her having that iconic no moment as the camera pans up and around, the story would go the same. She'd kill them all, she'd get her revenge, it's who she is as much as it's who Max is. The format, though, the format of the story is the prison, and the roles they've been given the prison sentences. Two-thirds through, the story catches up to one of the flash-forwards in a genuinely well-done moment where Max's police partner, a woman named Winterson, betrays Max in the way she'd been telegraphing for hours. Winterson pulls her pistol to shoot Mona, Mona starts to draw hers in defense. Max doesn't have time to think, and he doesn't need any time. He guns down Winterson before she can fire. Max is a wanted criminal again. For love! But what does love even mean in the context of Max Payne 2? These characters spend tops 48 hours with each other. They've got a connection, I'll buy that because the voice actors are good at selling it, but love? Even Max wonders about that in the very first bit of dialogue in the game. 
In terms of what's in the game, they flirt, Mona showers for Max and presumably the player's benefit, and Max and Moma, Mona have one moment of pretty serious making out. This is a paper-thin basis for love. On the surface level, what Max has with Mona helps him accept himself. The last line of the game is, quote, I had a dream about my wife. She was dead, but it was all right. Is that because Max let go of the weight of her memory now that he's found a new guilt? Or is it because, kicking things back down to the meta-commentary, he's finally realized that he had no choice and no hope when it came to saving either of them? That's her role, the catalytic corpse. It was as scripted and immutable as his role as a vengeful cop on the edge. Mona dies, and Max feels release. That's odd. He's either an asshole or having a fatalistic epiphany, and I actually lean toward the latter on this. Settling on an interpretation, whether the game is earnestly shallow or winkingly deep, is made harder by the changes in the moment-to-moment -mo -moment gameplay that muddy the first game's tight, engaging rhythm of play. Primarily, the difficulty has been readjusted in a strange way that I just can't quite put my finger on. On higher difficulties, Max is as fragile as ever, but on the lower ones, he's a bit of a tank, and his durability saps a lot of the tension out. On the other hand, the combat encounters are much longer, larger, and more populated than Max Payne 1. There's a lot more people to kill, and the difficulty readjustment seems to be a reaction to this, giving extra breathing room for making mistakes during marathon gun battles. The thing is, though, that the first Max Payne, and Alan Wake to come, for that matter, used small groups of enemies in strategically premeditated positions and loadouts, with small exceptions like the Ragnarok boss battle. Max Payne 2 throws goons at you in clumps and waves both, sometimes with what seems like a plan, but more often just in groups that are simply dangerous for the size of them. It's like the parking garage level from the first game, but it never ends. Max's new face and the goon's new faces look more polished, for the era anyway, but they've lost all their distinctiveness and charm. The generic thugs here truly are generic, where before they had a goofy charm to them that was a major source of my feeling of fun in the combat. And Max himself just seems slightly off. Timothy Gibbs is a perfectly fine-looking dude, but his DirectX 8 approximation looks like a melancholy frog, and it's hard not to long for Sam Lake's excessive, expressive, old-school Max. Bullet Time also gives you a longer duration to play around with, another thing that helps balance out the larger scope of the combat encounter design while sapping tension. The end result feels shockingly devoid of the big personality on display in Max Payne 1. In terms of features and essential structure, they do play the same way, but the specifics of balance and the engagement are just different enough to deeply alter the feel of the whole thing. And here, there is no, ah, but I'm doing ironically, you see, defense. The John Woo-isms in the animation department also start to go a little off the rails, most iconically the weird and totally unnecessary pirouette Max does when reloading in bullet time. There were a lot of instances of the game wanting to look badass and impress with its badassery, where what I really wanted was for Max to focus and not dodge roll off the balcony. The blandness of the combat draws out the blandness of the environments as well. Max Payne has always been about gray, undecorated industrial spaces as a matter of cost-saving game design, but Max Payne 2 suffers much more without having quite as much to latch onto as far as the charm department is concerned. The conspiracy in Max Payne 1 was fast-moving, lots of ups, downs, new characters. In Max Payne 2, it's the same old characters having hidden motivations teased out over the course of a couple dozen levels. So while you're in those levels, it's not about what you will or won't find, it's really just about getting through to the next thing, which is just as concrete and lifeless as the last thing. It creates a mood of exhaustion and anxiety, which is probably what they were going for, actually. But it also sheds the community theater spirit that kept the whole thing flowing along swiftly and evenly the first time out, and it's hardly an evenly weighted creative exchange. These mechanical flaws are earnest choices that didn't pan out too well. So am I reading too much into it to think that the game's being so arch and self-critical in the narrative department? Couldn't it be that those things are also just earnest choices that didn't pan out too well? Absolutely. Like I said, the game is a kaleidoscope. Turn it, and a different pattern appears every time. In 2003, the alterations in the graphics and technical presentation might have shown an ambition towards a more consistent and forward-looking 3D aesthetic, but here in 2018, it feels like they've polished off the most memorable facets of the first game. On a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I don't enjoy Max Payne 2 very much, even in mechanical situations similar to the original game. 
Something about it is just fundamentally bland and strange, much like the studio would do with Alan Wake's peculiar half-sequel, American Nightmare. I never did much understand that game either, but if I had played Max Payne 2 before I played American Nightmare, a lot of things would have clicked into place. For example, in Address Unknown, John Mira's double, John Mira, is a serial killer on the loose doing terrible things for which the protagonist will be blamed. He has the protagonist's girlfriend, who favors the killer Mira over the original Mira. That's almost the exact plot of American Nightmare, where Wake's double, Mr. Scratch, goes around killing in Alan's name and threatening Alan's wife, so it's up to Alan to navigate a dark dream world to stop him. Scratch talks to Alan through, you guessed it, the television. There's a tangle of threads running through many Remedy, Remedy games, themes of madness and fatalistic tragedy, and Max Payne 2 was essentially the foundational work for the weirdest, most experimental elements of that thematic line of thinking. Max Payne 1 would have been fine without Max Payne 2. Even Max Payne 3 kind of hand waves the second game's plot elements with a single line of dialogue. But Alan Wake, I'm coming to believe, would not have been nearly so tight or so good if Remedy hadn't taken this opportunity to fly their freak flag as high as they did. The dream sequences, the self-aware genre criticism, the uneasy sense that what you're seeing is not exactly what's going on. It's all a little awkward and strange here in Max Payne 2, but with a new protagonist in Alan Wake, it all ends up landing a lot better. In Max Payne 1, Address Unknown was just a nod to Twin Peaks and the David Lynch school of storytelling. In Max Payne 2, it's the one thing about the game that seems to serve a unifying purpose. The one thing that makes sense as a lens to view the game through. I know a lot of people take this game straightforwardly and seriously, and critics at the time praised the love story with Mona in a really earnest way. I'm genuinely confused by this. You'll find deeper, more sensical relationships on Hill Street Blues than you'll find in Max Payne 2. If you play the game a couple more times over and, and then beating the highest difficulty, the last scene changes to one where Mona lives and Max comments on how he doesn't really deserve that. If you didn't know it was there, then you'd have to play through a story you thought was immutable and fixed twice before finding that it isn't quite immutable. But the secret ending undermines not only the abstract reading, but the straightforward one as well, essentially invalidating 60% or so of Max's internal dialogue. Is it meant to show that nothing is completely predestined if you try hard enough, or is it meant to show favor to the player for having put so much effort into the game? The plot ele elements outside the romantic elements is just mob war with, like, two small complications and double crosses. Why, exactly, is Max Payne 2 so well-remembered when it's such a fractured and strange experience to actually play? I looked at the surface level, and the game felt like it came across as a flat, warm soda. I looked deeper, and I found a game that isn't about an NYPD cop learning to love again, but a game about a fictional character realizing the words of his story were written in advance. That sure seems like a stretch at first glance, but it's also the actual serious plot of Alan Wake, so it's not like Remedy writers weren't thinking on these themes. Sam Lake was lead writer on Alan Wake as well. Otherwise, you've got a sequel like any sequel. More of what you loved, less of what surprised you the first time around. Max Payne is more archetype than man. In Max Payne 1, he lives out the archetypal clichés, fulfills his hard-boiled destiny. In Max Payne 2, a more abstract and melancholy Max recognizes what happened as destiny and not choice, and finds solace in it. His wife is dead, but it was all right. And that could be it for Max, if not for Rockstar Games' equally peculiar sequel, which launches itself directly from the shoulders of this game. You see, for a man whose whole life is a, mesh, is a messy cliché to which he has fully resigned himself, the hardest and most frightening thing is in the blood, or the bullets, or the booze. The hardest thing Max Payne could ever do at this point in the series is change. Welcome to Max's Midlife Crisis. So I guess I become... Max Payne 3 is my favorite of the three, but only because of what came before, and the myriad of genuinely clever ways this bizarre, high-budget, high-gloss sequel interacts with both the strengths of the previous games. It leverages the earnest, metaphor-factory Max from the first game, and consciously forces him into conflict with his own cliché, all of the second Max Payne. The game opens with another flash-forward, but a meaner, grittier one than before. It's not about conspiracy or a tragic emotion, it's about Max being the man he's expected to be. Nothing more than a gun who does what he's told. It opens long after Max left New York City altogether, beating him in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he works as a security contractor for a very rich man with very dangerous enemies. I don't want to start there, though. I want to begin where Max does, after the end of the second game. 
floating at the bottom of a bottle in some anonymous Jersey dive bar. Max had fulfilled almost all of his cliché, except for the last part, where he must drink himself to death in a lonely and dirty apartment. It's this process that gets interrupted by a man with a job offer. Max doesn't want it, initially, but he kills a mob boss's son over a matter of respect, so there's not a lot of other options for him except to leave. In Max Payne 2, Max said, referencing both plot and game design, quote, Firing a gun is a binary choice. You either pull the trigger, or you don't. It's the fatis fatalistic cliché of his character that Max was always going to pull the trigger here, too, in this bar where he was trying to fade away quietly. What's really interesting about this is that the rest of the game's plot is spent piecing together the conspiracy that began at this moment. The assumptions about Max's simplicity and gullibility that get proved right over and over again. The villains of this game guess that Max is exactly the washed-up old loser he comes across as. They guess that there's not enough spark left in him to deviate from the choices they give him. They guess he's given up on the idea of there even being a right thing to do, let alone doing it. Max is down to the simple things. Binary choices. Pull the trigger or don't. And it works for Max's new employers, all the way up until it doesn't, when Max finally realizes this whole awful mess has been rigged from the start to pivot on his own short-sightedness and incompetence. The only way to bring the bad guys down is to defy their expectations, and in so doing, defy his own archetype, his own prescribed role in the story. Max doesn't get better at killing people over the course of the game, he starts good at it, and he isn't even sober. The arc he follows is one where he gets better at seeing, seeing himself for the joke he's become, seeing the gossamer chains that bind those around him, seeing the cruelty he's helped perpetuate, and then choosing to do something about it. Swapping studios is a dicey thing for most game franchises, and there's a good portion of fans of the original two games who'll tell you that Max Payne 3 is a bad Max Payne sequel, or just a bad game in general, because of how unpredictably and strangely it plays with the iconography and presentation of previous Max Paynes. It swaps New York for Sao Paulo, it swaps graphic novel panels for fully rendered cutscenes, it swaps a fatalistically heroic Max for a miserable, self-defeating one. There's so much about the game that's different, and yet the character himself and the connections to the previous games are tremendously faithful and strong. Time has passed for Max and for the player both. Max Payne 3 came out in 2012. Nine years is a long gap between games. To think nothing would change in so long a gap is ridiculous. A decade is enough time for the whole world to change, and it did. Just think for a moment how culturally and emotionally distant the last few months of pre-9-11 America seem now. Those were the months that the original Max Payne was released in. It's exhausting to even think about all the life that's happened since then. Max is confused and lost in the world of 2012. If his mid-century archetype was an anachronism in 2001, it is antediluvian in the smartphone era. In this, though, we come full circle, where the earnest cop that no one had faith in finds himself pitted against a lying, chaotic world that makes no sense to him, just like the original game. Like the original game, Max is bound to his cliché like an iron ball around his ankle. But this time, it'll pull him down into the water and drown him at last if he can't get it off. Max was in a violent video game again. Funny as hell, it was the worst thing he could think of. Rockstar's stamp as a developer is certainly present, but not as much as I was led to believe about this game. I had heard from people that it was some kind of cynical cash grab that gets everything wrong. My experience, though, is that in almost every way that counts, Max Payne 3 is thoughtfully faithful to the original vision of Max Payne 1. The most notable change is the introduction of Rockstar's studio-standard cover mechanics, where instead of relying completely on bullet time and fast reactions like the original two Max Paynes, this new Max is completely content to hunker down behind a desk and occasionally pop off a few rounds. All the previous mechanics are largely intact, the bullet time, the shoot dodging, the lethality of the bullets, but the remedy style is best suited to small clumps of enemies. Look at Alan Wake, it's largely the same as Max Payne in terms of encounter sizing, spacing, and rhythm. Grand Theft Auto 4 is much different, and it's that combat design that Rockstar draws from. The Rockstar style of populating whole city blocks with dozens of enemies requires a mechanic that allows a player to be safe while figuring out where the fire is even coming from. Max Payne 1 and 2 are corridor shooters, despite the third-person frame. Max Payne 3 is more of a neighborhood shooter. It's reliant on massive, high-production set pieces in a way that the original games were not very much. Allowing Max time to breathe and to assess was not part of the original design, but largely because assessment was quick. 
One hallway, two doors, four dudes, assessment done. It's all over in a matter of seconds, one way or another. Max Payne 3 is more familiar in its action movie scale. Here come a dozen armed mercenaries at once, from three directions, and a giant foyer. Think about Rockstar's own GTA series. For Tommy Versetti and Vice City, there's no cover system. And the combat, as a result, feels awkwardly hectic and often unfair, and the more enemies you add, the less fun the game becomes. Then Nico Bellic gets a cover system in GTA 4, and all of a sudden, shootouts are more active, because you're not literally running behind a corridor to break the line of sight. And more fair, because being exposed to fire becomes a personal tactical choice, and not an immutable fact of combat. Nico Bellic takes out waves of enemies, because Nico's old friend the Concrete Pillar can absorb a lot of their fury. It preserves the suspension of disbelief, as the scale of conflict cartoonishly escalates higher and higher and higher. Could Rockstar have kept Remedy's rhythm of combat? Sure. But doing it this way plays to their individual strengths as a developer. They get to take what they already knew how to do in the microcosm of the combat loop, and then utterly decouple it from the wide-open worlds that they're known for. Max Payne 3, despite the scale of the levels, is still a linear sequence of scares, focusing on just one story, just one escalation of events to be played in a linear order is unusual for Rockstar. Even Bully, their one-off experimental game, involves more player freedom than Max Payne 3. Freedom, though, is not thematically appropriate for Max. Max is about seeing the end coming, turning left, turning right, and still meeting it head-on no matter what you do. And being faithful to that element of Max Payne, Rockstar was able to make a game that feels not only like a natural extension of Remedy's work, but like a strange experimental deviation from their own. It's obviously a Rockstar title in the moment-to-moment -moment feel of the game, but it's the design inverse of most of its studio siblings in the aggregate experience. These changes seem to pop even brighter among the lights and graffiti of digital Sao Paulo. The game's most iconic little moment is one where Max is accompanying some much younger partygoers as they arrive at a nightclub by helicopter. Max hates every single thing about it. The people, the wealth, the vanity, the utter lack of purpose or meaning in his life or theirs. Max's ward says, What do you know about life, Max? And Max answers, Look at me. I'm standing in a nightclub, listening to music I can't stand. I'm 5,000 miles from home. I'm armed, and I'm drinking. You don't want life advice from me. As frivolous and off-putting as the club kids are, Max's life is an order of meaningless below even that to have ended up being their drunk, armed chaperone. Not only that, but the conversation is cyclical. Months ago, revealed in a late-game flashback, Max and him were on a yacht in the Panama Canal having a similar conversation, though Max was less gracious and more plastered that time around. Max drifted off into a nap and woke up, still drunk, to find that nearly everyone on board was pulled off the boat and murdered as he slept off the booze. Max has to be reminded of this by another character because he was so deep in his funk that he barely registered it as being something that actually happened. Playing through the level, everything does seem unsure and strange, as Max struggles to string clues together and piece together the plot threads that he had earlier balled up and threw away. In the previous games, the hard-drinking cop act was a big part of the cliché. The games made a mechanic of Max's painkiller addiction, having him pop pills as a way to make his health bar regenerate. Here in the third game, all those pills are taken more seriously. Max is in a haze for much of the game. He forgets things. He doesn't see things in the first place. The Max Payne who had worn Sam Lake's face and only recently lost his wife might have seen through all the violence and the bullshit, but that Max is lost to time and lost to regret. He's crossed an ocean of whiskey since then and can no longer see the shore. Any shore. When Max shows up, he is barely functional. And that makes him the perfect fall guy. More is that in between all of the early missions, Max ceases to function completely, all alone in his apartment, getting blackout and living in filth. His consumption is no longer glamorous, it is nakedly an attempt at self-annihilation. All Max has is his job, and his job is to stand at that expensive nightclub's bar, high above the slums, and pretend he can't remember being the kind of person who would be disgusted at himself for being there. It's actually a remarkably adult take for a Rockstar game when it comes to that sort of excessive consumption. Usually, they play it for laughs, or do it as a function of some character archetype or cliché. Here, Max isn't a hard-drinking gumshoe acting like he just stepped out of the Maltese Falcon. Here, Max couldn't even get served at the bar the way he is most of the time now. The drinking is sad to see, and is itself a function of sadness. He's not a cop, not even close. 
The game serves as a portrait not of a hero, but of a henchman. Max is working for the bad guys the whole time. He's just in too deep a hole to notice or care in the early game, even as the dirt rains down on him by the shovelful. How did he fall so far to be this thing, this hired gun with no morals from the opening flash forward? Well, we know. This is the third game. We know he tried to be normal, and that was taken away. We know he tried to break free from his cliché and live passionately, and that was taken away, too. We know that he gave up after that. And we know that that was a long time ago now. The differences between Max and the goons with guns who have stood in his way has been reduced to pretty much nothing. This, more than any element of violence or sleaze, is what makes the story genuinely gritty. Max doesn't much deserve to win, but he is much too stubborn to die. Seeing all of that play out is a fantastic, elevating frame for a game that might have otherwise been a by-the-numbers action sequel. The flip side of all the attention paid to theme and characterization is that at the heart of the games has always been an attention to spectacle and the use of spectacle to keep the plot moving and the player immersed. Max Payne's marketing material has always emphasized the action over the brooding meta-commentary, and the action has always been strong enough to support the weight of that emphasis. Bullet time mechanics and the explosive particles of wood, paper, and concrete that fluff up into unpredictable clouds in slow motion were genuinely groundbreaking in 2001, and Max Payne 3 pays a lot of homage to that by being much more detailed in the destructibility of its environments than any Max Payne that came before. Many of the levels seem specifically themed around different types of architecture and materials that can shatter and deform in especially exciting ways. It's taking what was already an important part of the game's visual characterization and dialing it up higher than ever before. In a way, the cover system heaps even more emphasis on these particle effects because the gunfights are more sprawling and protracted than before, making it so you spend more time creating and experiencing the, cha the chaotic frenzy of the moment. Add to this the stunt shots, where Max performs some kind of feat of athleticism while puffing off wild trick shots. It's a participatory cutscene, essentially, and while some may complain about the on-rails nature of the scenes and how it removes the player's control over their own fight choreography, the spectacle is undeniably stylish. It better serves the first game's ambition towards a cinematic feel more than anything in that original work. Max Payne 3 gets made fun of a lot for having cutscene after cutscene after cutscene, some just one hallway away from the last one, but looking back you'll find that the original game's comic panels occurred at a similar frequency. They were just more low-key, obviously passive. Here the line between passive and active cutscene is constantly blurred, and that can be both frustrating and exhilarating. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that even if this rhythm of scripted, highly linear play isn't something you'd want in every game, Max Payne 3 is not every game. It's a surprisingly experimental title. It's okay with being divisive that way. There are other games that focus much more on player freedom and player participation, many of them in Rockstar's own catalog. Max Payne 3 is a strange what-if, where traditional, sensible ratios of gameplay to cutscene are completely discarded in favor of something more obviously passive, where the player is more watching Max than being Max. This actually interacts really well with the already present themes of predestination and fatalism. Take it or leave it is the only choice given. Should every game be like Max Payne 3? Hell no. Is it okay for Max Payne 3 to be playful with accepted wisdom about how to present a game's narrative as an individual artistic work? Hell yes. Max's personal history also gives context to the game's portrayal of Sao Paulo as a sweat-drenched city of extreme wealth and extreme poverty, where sex and drugs and lies are around every corner and no one can be trusted. The thing is, this was also Max Payne's portrayal of New York City. The original game set its levels among bars and brothels to create an image of a city at the mercy of its own cruelty and vice. Max wants things to be a fresh start by going to Brazil. But it isn't, and it can't be. Instead, it's the same shit, different hemisphere. Thematically, this is extremely important in Max's character arc and the noirish construction of the world. Yes, the scene where Max goes to the Favela's brothel and walks down a lot of hallways with a lot of sad, exploitative sex going on before getting to the plot point is deliberately gross and condemnatory, but I have a feeling that they would have included the scene if it had been set in Hoboken and not the Favela. It would serve the same purpose of illustrating the world in cynical, hostile colors. There are good people in the city, genuinely good ones, and not just broken anti-heroes like Max. There's a cop, Wilson De Silva, who's one of the few uncorruptible, serious cops in the city. He's working on the same mystery as Max, and is much farther ahead with it. Max, in the very first game, wasn't too different. Well-decorated, compassionate, effective, and then the night his family gets murdered. 
In Max Payne 3, before he leaves Jersey, Max makes a detour to see his family's graves. He thinks about how they've been dead and in the ground for longer than they were ever married by this point. That life, that person, is distant. There's so little of him now that the 1990s Max would recognize or like. In that scene, three mobsters step out to fan around the grave, and then a shootout begins. The life that Max wanted, lying dead and rotten under the life he's got. Wilson is a reminder of who he used to be, and the interesting thing about their dialogue together is how impatient Wilson is with Max, how Wilson conveys a kind of quiet, passive contempt for what a blind idiot Max has been being. And yet, the person Max is now, not a cop, but just a killer, is able to do what Wilson can't. The system is too corrupt to allow for justice to work the way it's intended, so Wilson seeks out Max, gives him just enough information to point him in a new direction, and then waits to follow the trail of carnage that Max leaves behind him. Once Max burns away the corruption, Wilson can do his own job. They're two sides of the same cliché, the hero cop and the fallen cop, and they rub off on each other in interesting ways. Wilson gets a little dirtier, Max gets a little cleaner, and by the time the story is over, neither are stuck in their limbo anymore. It's also notable how, in the previous games, it was a conspiratorial force that got Max off the hook for citywide violence and <clears throat> that followed him around. Here, Max is busting the heads of the main conspirators, and it's a sympathetic, everyday kind of person who chooses to help him. So we reach the end, and the moment of the flash-forward comes around again. At first, we thought it reflected poorly on Max, that he was a man who had lost himself completely. The twist is that in this moment he's more himself than he's been in years. In the lead-up to the end, Max fully expects to die. He doesn't much care if he does or doesn't. It's a genuine sacrifice he's making. Everything he has, he's giving to right the wrongs that he's been drunkenly complicit in. When they hired Max, they told him they wanted him to protect the innocent. They were lying about who the innocent were, but Max was paid, and he'll do the job until the guilty are dead. Max's self-annihilation with the drinking was without meaning or purpose. Dying here, doing this, would mean something. But he doesn't die, which leaves him instead with a new beginning. He doesn't want to be who he was. He doesn't have to be anymore. He's free from his demons, his cliché, his destiny. What Max does now is his own damn business. To escape that fatalistic cycle is the true climax of his whole character arc, and to see him simply walk off into the sunset feels like a kinder ending than I'd ever envisioned for him. What'll the rest of his life be like? Boring, probably. Maybe he'll get a boat. Whatever it is, it won't be good material for a video game. And what's too boring for a Max Payne video game is just about as good as it gets for Max Payne the character. That fundamental tension between the player's entertainment and Max's misery is the secret to the game's success. At the end of the trilogy, all that tension dissipates. The story is over. Let the man live in peace. Thanks for watching. I'd like to take a moment to thank by name the people who are currently donating $10 a month or more through the crowdfunding website Patreon. Without you guys, these videos wouldn't be possible at all. So I'd like to thank people like Dirk Warbrill, Low Beyonder, Brandon Boat, Matthew Mason, Galak, Josh Dewey, Brian Pluckelman, Chris Kayon, David Carlson, Sean, Jacob Siegelman, N.K. Jemison, Bobby Sims, Morton Sconning, David Betancourt, Josh Farkas, Ashley Rain, Nobody, Leo Neal, Chris Larkey, Tu Nguyen, Dylan Ball, Michael Coonan, Jeremy Sanders, C.E. Keen, Eric Jepson, Tyler Dowsey, Roman Alexiev, Carl Gleason, Lasselis, Darian Desitel, Fergus Foley, Aurelian, Noah Kentrowitz, Tom Rowerdick, Your Local Moo Moo, Tom Vickers, Danny Kilpatrick, Colin Guti, Connor McLeod, Saibot D, Daniel Pining, Nate Williamson, Alexander Sundin, Ethan Cossett, Tim Marsh, Abdulrahman Alabsi, Radev Akoy, Andrew Tapp, Mark Phillips, Adrian Kumale, Skylar Basilis, Colby Howard, Nathan Jansen, Argus Swift, Sorcerer Dave, Yazan Barguti, Harry Eyeball, Free Morphine, Rich Stower, David Orrin Christensen, Hazra Fadousafar, Matthew Cassidy, David Harpstreit, I Cannot Fly, Sharif Kazemi, Wesley M., Greg Rucka, Matt Bargenquast, Q. Ray X., Edward Small, Zach B., Eric Amundsen, Colin Bassnett, Jordan Klein, Jesse Denton, Simon Neerfolk, Tyler Rush, Fakey McName, Scorpion Strike, 
Cassie, Jared, or Cassie, Jared Olszewski, El Weasel, Colin, Alex B., Fyodor Kaspersik, Andrew Foltz, Byron Callan, Mikhail Aristov, Daniel Mower Myrie, Brad Smith, Micah Shalom Kesselman, Martin Lutz, Andy Mitchell, Eric Joyner, Ryan Van Dyke, The Soul James, Pascal Moray, Michael Atwell, Ian Boudreau, Nikolai, Lucas Bernard, Brennan Ritchie, Lupus Yonderboy, Alex Nikiforov, Cameron Booth, Gordon Graham, Stephen Hine, Max Pandoja, Sam Bellmeyer, Trivium Art History, Plebzi, Hans Kupier, Devin Fitzpatrick, Joaquin Coleman, Stephen Potya, Andrew Boissano, Ivan Ganchev, Anxiety Cat, Clay Harrington, Philip Coffey, Eric Robinson, Kyle Zayner, Alex Zalato, Paul Clark, Stephen Garrett Day, Jean Philippe Malouin, Malouin, Will Edwards, Robert Glover, Jeanette Ng, Anthony Gallant, Maurice Desquiro, The Noble Gamer, Nemo Vandenbrink, Dice Prophet, Jack Harvey, Thomas Kirstner, Andrew Oplinger, April, Gilosa, Will Wargrave, Noah, I know you're reading this out loud. Patrick McGanahan, Sebastian Pironi, Will Dobbins, Alexander Krohns, Luke Murphy, John Hendrick Hansen, Tom Painter, Oscar Stangenberg, Edward Clayton Andrews, Tinfoil Pancakes, Samuel Procopio Xavier, Dominic Carlin, Kim Winson, Devin Vernon, Jacob McMillan, Tizar Vicarian, Medal of Connor, Jody Warden, Jody Warren, Elijah Nelson, Robot Ghost, Greg Mirlas, Aiden AK-47, Josh Graytack, Sean Weber, Andrew Bregager, Hercules Johnson, Will Hooten, Cy, Cole Allen, Alexander Romanoff, Jesse Wilkison, Alexander Ofodu, Lucas Marcondes de Mora, Toad Hart, Aaron Albach, Matthew Sutton, William Holmes, Manuel Weedman, Zach Korpstein, Ryan Snyder, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Arturo Cordova Penic, Arturo Covardias Penigua, Dana Stubcare, Ian Glasgow, Jeremy McQuaid, Nicholas Rona Jorgensen, Peter Flink, Tim Dodds, Jack 8A77 NC8, Kevin Schaub, Anthony Bardill, Andrew Montevillo, Jared Meyer, Andreas Larson, Brian Hill, Lars Braken, Igor Babia. Dan Thompson, Cumarin Vigiani, Alexander Leister, Morgan Mull, World War II Freak, Aaron Darwin, Eli Bergmas, Dennis Clark, Daniel, Daniel Pennypacker, Corey Bofield, Jack Dawson, Nick Cole Hamilton, Carol Henderson, Reference Error, Milky Way Resident, Vance Jordan Falls, Soy Sheik, Comfy Hat, Eddie Burton, Gabriel Nichols, and Ron Gervais, who is kind enough to be holding the camera for me today. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. And thanks to everyone else who's donating less than $10 a month. You guys are equally as important, and I'm very appreciative. Thanks for watching.